Hi, I'm Mike Abbott. Welcome to Founder Stories. With me today we have Stephen Kirsch from One ID. Mike. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks. So first, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, One ID. Well, One ID arose from my frustration and um, my siblings' frustrations with the username and password system and just having too many usernames and passwords to manage. And my uh, sister called me up and said her, her uh, Yahoo account got broken into and she asked me for advice because I'm the computer expert in the family. And so I said, well, change your password, run a malware checker. And she said, okay, fine, if I do all that, then how do I know it's safe to log into my bank or PayPal? And I said, well, you don't. And that was just a horrible thing to have to tell my sister in 2011, you know, with all this technology that you don't know whether it's safe to log into your bank or PayPal. Hmm. And so with that was kind of the, the impetus to say, hey, there are, we need to fix this problem. This is ridiculous that we don't have a solution to this, being able to have a secure login, a secure identity, to have a single identity that we can assert anywhere on the internet and have it be accepted. And so you have a US passport which is accepted in the US, it's accepted by state, state agencies, it's accepted around the world. And yet we don't have the, analogy, the analogous type of identity where you can have a single identity and present that uh, to any website and have them accept that as your identity. And so that's why we started OneID to provide that sort of single identity that you can use anywhere, one password to remember, and uh, we use public key cryptography in order to keep it secure. And uh, we've done all sorts of clever things so that even if your device is stolen or whatever, that your identity can't be compromised. Even if someone broke into our servers and changed all our code, um, they still can't compromise your identity. And that's a big, big shift um, from where we are before, where we can actually create an identity that is a third-party identity service that is actually more trustable than the native identity of a, of a bank or, or any website. Well, one of the things that's so remarkable to me uh, about your background is One ID is your sixth startup. You've had big successes, big companies like InfoSeq. You started in '82, yeah, uh, building the first optical mouse. That's right. Across six companies, and, and combined with the fact that I mean, you're uh, academically studied computer science and engineering at MIT. How? Tell us a little bit about you as a CEO through those six companies and. I mean, perhaps you weren't the CEO at each one, but just, just share with us a little bit like what you, how you changed as a leader across those companies and embody that today at One ID. <laughs> well, you have to, to try, hopefully you'll little, learn a little bit along the way, but one of the things I found is you make, you make very similar mistakes uh, from company to company, and you think you'd learn from your mistakes, but you know, people have different skills, and those tend, and they have, particular ways about going about things. And those tend not to change very much. It's, it, people are very hard to change. And so the big learning is, hey, what are you really good at? And what are your strengths? And then try to uh, surround yourself with people who have complementary skills. Uh, because you're not going to be able to uh, be able to do something uh, that, uh, that you weren't good at before, necessarily. It's probably not going to happen, especially you know, at our age. And you know, if you're more than 12 years old, I think you're pretty much wired. And uh, behavioral change is really, really hard, so focus on what you really like to do well. Uh, and one of the other thing I learned is that being uh, the chief technology guy and being the CEO at the same time, that's really, really hard. You know, kind of pick one that you're gonna do, and uh, don't try and do them both, because trying to do both is, is very, very difficult. And, you know, Try to surround yourself with people that will keep you from making the same mistakes. So I tended, for example, I tended to underhire people. Um, when I first started, I said, hey, you know, I can work with anyone and then we can train them and get them up to speed and so forth. Um, and uh, the hiring, I think, is the mo number one most important thing. The number one biggest thing that mm -hmm. you can do as a CEO that's going to determine your fate as a company. And you look at companies like Google and you look at Tesla, for example. I mean, like Tesla is really remarkable, right? You go from a um, car company that now has a 99 out of 100 score at Consumer Reports. And the reason they did that, and the, the thing that most impressed me about Tesla was that they hired just brilliant uh, people, people who are really experts in their area. And they spent a lot of time on the recruiting and the hiring. And they don't hire people unless they can show a special skill. Um, how, are they, how are you different? How are you, you know, one out of 100? 
and you have to prove to them that you can do that or Elon's not going to sign up, uh, sign off on your being hired there. So the quality of the people, r pay attention to that. That's, you know, if, if there is one th lesson that I learned that's the, the biggest ingredient to success, and you look at Google. The reason Google is so successful is they said, hey, we're only going to hire people from the Ivy Leagues and MIT and, you know, all, all these uh, places. And, you know, they make exceptions in a few cases, but they're pretty much going after super, super bright people. And um, so that's, you know, and look at how well they're doing. Mm -hmm. So digging in on a little bit more around quality, because I completely agree with you. What have you, what have you learned, or how do you apply ensuring quality in your hiring at 1ID from your lessons from the, the prior five companies? Yeah, so um, I, I'm not sure we do the best job uh, at it, but we try, you know, there's, I think the, the best thing that I've seen on hiring on the web that, that people can look at as a resource uh, is the Greylock. Um, have you seen that there's a gr uh, presentation by Greylock in terms mm -hmm. of how the Greylock companies hire people? And um, I think we aspire to do that, um, but you know, we try to try and copy some of the ideas that we've learned from other companies in terms of, hey, what's, what's their background? Uh, what's their skill? You know, what separates you? Are you why are you special? 99. What's your superpower? Yeah. Uh, kind of thing. So really finding out that these guys are cut above um, just the, the regular crowd. We don't want to hire someone who can do the job. We want to hire someone who's going to really enhance uh, the position. So we're looking for special qualities mm -hmm. uh, uh, in the people that will, will make them different. And we're not going to hire the first person, second person, third person. I mean, we tend to uh, interview a bunch of people uh, for the job and not kind of jump at the, the first person and see who's out there, see who we can That's get, interesting. and then um, then make a decision. So, you know, you may interview 10 people and, and, and hire one. And that's what you should be doing because you really want to get the best people. It's like, uh, you know, it's, hey, Stanford, right? Mm -hmm. so they only take, you know, 3% of the, mm -hmm. the, the students that apply, right? You want to be just like that, right? And so you go to Stanford, right? And you talk to any of the students there, and the students there are incredible. You know, my, my daughter was lucky enough uh, to get in, and, um, you know, she introduces to, my fr to, uh, uh, to her friends, and, uh, you know, they're just, each one of them is just very, very special in, in a different way, and it's like, great combination of intelligence and people working together that, that mm -hmm. uh, can really make a difference in, your, in any company. So if the quality of people is a common thread, which makes great sense, if you look back between the 80s and the 90s and even the 2000s, one of the things that has changed a lot is just how products and software is built. Yeah. And 1ID today is about, you said, 20 people or so, half an engineering product manager or designer. How, how do you build your product and your service at 1ID, and how has that been influenced from this, the changes over the last uh, couple decades? Yeah, well, so um, every situation is different, and uh, when we started 1ID, uh, I had a vision of here's what I wanted to do, and I co contacted people who were really talented in the engineering side, and it turned out that the guy um, who had the most engineering smarts and talent and could give me an instant team, and it was really inexpensive, it turns out that he was in Austin, and that uh, is what... I'd call it geographically undesirable because in a startup company you really want to have everybody in the same building and you know everybody working together and it is um, really tough if you're spread out over two uh, two different areas especially when you're so far apart right mm -hmm. it's a several hour plane ride um, and uh, well with you know things like Skype and Google Hangouts and so forth you can make it so that it's not as bad but I don't think there's any um, substitute for face, FaceTime and being in the same building. Um, so when we when we started off, you know, this guy was just so ups, ex, number one, he was so exceptional, and number two is that he could build up a team of ten people uh, instantly uh, in Austin, and plus they'd be much cheaper than building it uh, in uh, in Silicon Valley with the same level of talent. Um, so that was a little bit too hard to resist. I'm not sure that was the right call. Um, but it was at least a reasonable decision based on the pros and cons. So ideally, everybody in the same place, but if you have a special situation that we were willing to consider doing that, um, and it's actually worked out pretty well because then these guys can be totally focused, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, we're arguing about, well, you know, should the strategy be this and this, and nobody's being defocused. So in and a sense, it, it's good to de decouple them because they, then they can stay focused on... And, on and that's an interesting segue to, to culture. I mean, you've probably had aspects that were similar parts of culture across the six companies and differences because of the people. Yeah. 
How do you, I'd love to hear your comments on culture and then in relation, especially to having a distributed team at this early of a stage. Yeah, I, so I, I think culture is uh, really, really important to, to um, um, sit down at the beginning and say, hey, you know, what do we stand for and what are, what are the values and just be um, consistent with that. And in, in some sense, you, you read a lot of books that say, hey, it really doesn't matter what values you pick. You can pick any set of values as long as you're consistent and people um, know what it is and can, um, uh, you know, all play by the same set of rules. You know, that's the more important uh, thing. And uh, I read uh, the, the story of Zappos and uh, played golf recently with uh, David Vick, who was the, the culture uh, guru at Zappos. So it was really interesting in, in talking to him because he's kind of like the Zappos, the extreme case of, of culture in the extreme. And, um, you know, in my case, of the, the companies that, We've had various emphasis on culture um, in the various companies, and you could say, hey, you know, startup company, you got to focus on the product, and what are you doing, this culture stuff, this is softy feely stuff. Um, but it uh, turns out that it's, it's pretty important, you know, more important than, than people think. Do you assert there's a high correlation between great people, culture, great success? Great, because great culture attracts great people. Mm -hmm. Right, yep, and you, what you want to do is have people come to work, and it's like want like, to be like there. family. They want to be there, mm -hmm. and they have the freedom to make mistakes, and they have the freedom to um, to try to wow the customer. You know that sort and of ideally, thing. Ideally, work isn't work. Right. <laughs> I think yeah, really that's right. That's it. right. Right. And you know, what's funny is that that uh, Zappos has this very unique culture, and you know, people come to Zappos and they look at the uh, you know just to see the the culture. It's, you know, is this mm -hmm. for real? Mm -hmm. Right. Is there really a throne here that you can sit on? And uh, when Amazon was purchasing um, um, was Zappos, uh, they one of the guys you know came and he sat on the throne, and um, uh, so he kind of wondered, well, is Zappos successful because of their culture or in spite of their culture? And so people on the outside actually ask that question, but if you ask people on the inside, it's a pretty clear, absolutely, the culture is a big part of our success. So that's... That's really interesting. It's an, yeah, it's an interesting insight. Well, Steve, thank you so much for coming on the Founder Stories, uh, to, and thank you for watching, and we'll talk to you next time.